stand to our feet here uh, tonight. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we glorify your holy name. And we thank you for this uh, season that is upon us, celebrating and remembering the birth of Jesus Christ as outlined in Scripture. And Father God, we ask for shalom over our nation and shalom over our homes and shalom over our hearts and minds as we, as we come into these final days. And Father God, we thank you for that now in Jesus' name. And Father, I ask for a blessing over all those that are here, all those that are watching, and all those that have financially given to this ministry. Father God, I ask that you give them back double their daily bread. And I ask that revival break out in the hearts and the souls of all those that have ever peered into this ministry over the 27 years, even if they peered in once, Father, that you go back and find them and your angels find them and bring revival to their hearts and their homes and their marriages and their, and their children and their physical bodies. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. You're welcome to take your seats. Ushers, if you would, come on forward here this, uh, tonight. And if you're watching live, uh, uh, we're glad to have you watching. Uh, become a regular financial partner with this ministry. Just a couple announcements. First of all, tonight we're going to be seeing the history of uh, the history of Christmas and Santa Claus again, and Bill Federer is a wonderful, accurate, very God-fearing man that teaches on the history of uh, Christmas and the history of Santa Claus, just like I do. He goes way in a, way more depth than I do, and and so I know that you're going to enjoy this. Now, this is the same video that we saw last year about this same time, and he goes so fast and, and covers so many documents and so many pieces of information, you're probably going to want to have a pen to write a lot of this stuff down so you remember it later on. Also, our our services this Sunday, this Sunday is Christmas Eve day, and so Sunday morning, we're going to have our regular Sunday morning service at 930, and then on Christmas Eve, the same day, Sunday evening, from 530 to 630 sharp. We'll start exactly at 5.30. We'll end exactly at 6.30. So all of you that have plans, family plans, and places that you need to go, trips that you need to go on, uh, you can count on us getting you out of here uh, at those times. So we open the doors uh, as usual on Sunday morning, and you can be here around 8.30. And then in the evening, we open the doors right around 4.30 on Sunday afternoon. So I hope you can make both services and be here and be in the presence of God. Uh, God's already spoken to me and to give me, have me give you a good word uh, this Sunday. Praise God. Anyway, uh, so let's enjoy uh, this uh, message here tonight. the history of St. Nicholas and Christmas holiday traditions. And I can only give the talk a couple times a year, and so this is that time. And, um, you know, we just got done with praise and worship, and I see the Christmas lights here. Um, I'm 64, so when I grew up, we spent a lot of time untangling Christmas <laughs> lights and finding the ones that didn't work. And, and I found something that it needs to complete the circuit, right? So imagine if you're have your plug and you're about to plug your Christmas light in and one of the prongs is broken and if you only plug in one prong do the lights turn on no you have to plug in both prongs what happens is the electricity comes from the power plant through the high power wires through the local lot into your house into that outlet and then it goes through the but in, in, unless it goes back it doesn't turn on and it actually, with alternating current, it goes back and forth like 60 times a second. So you're constantly giving, but you constantly have to give back. God has given you life, but unless you give it back to him in worship, your light doesn't turn on. It's when you worship the Lord and you let the love and the life that he's given to you, you give it back to him. You feel the, the, the power of the spirit of the Lord flowing through you, right? You know what I'm talking about? That's why it's so important to do praise and worship. And um, anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd throw that little analogy in there. So whenever you see Christmas lights, you've got to plug in both sides. You have to give the worship back to God. Well, let's go through some scriptures. <clears throat> and um, John 1, <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so Jesus was there at creation, right? He's, he's with the Father for eternity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But where was he in the scriptures? Well, if you read Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light. Well, what do you say but words, 
right? And so everything that God created, he created with words. So you got God the Father, you got the word Jesus, and then it says the, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. So when the word was spoken is when the Holy Spirit moved, right? So you have the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit right there and the creation. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together. So everything again, God, <clears throat> excuse me, was saying and creating things. So um, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. <clears throat> anyway, you get the picture there. Um, Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, and by him all things consist. So Jesus is with the Father and the Holy Spirit holding all things in existence. Hebrews 1.3, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and the upholding all things by the word of his power. And then John 1 says, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. Imagine that. The God of creation came and became man, but they didn't recognize him. But thank God we do. Now, I... Um, I like history, and so uh, December 25th, why do we have that date? And I thought, well, let me do a little research and find out. And so I did, and, and I think it's important because sometimes people in the world say, well, it's a pagan date, right? It's Roman Saturnalia, and it's all this stuff. And, and some people think, well, gee, if that's not true, maybe, and they begin to maybe doubt all their faith. And so um, an interesting little study, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947, and in there is the order of the Levites that served in the temple. So we got David, king of Israel. He breaks the Levite priests into uh, 24 family groups. And these 24 family groups have two times a year when they serve a week at the temple and take care of the sacrifices and the lighting of the incense and everything. And they, they knew that, that David did this, but they... In the Bible, it doesn't actually list the different orders of the 24 families and, and what weeks they served. And so why is this important? Remember John the Baptist's father, and it says he was in the temple offering incense, and it says he was of the course of Abijah. And we read it and don't really have a clue what it means. But Abijah was one of those 24 Levite family groups that took a week twice a year taking care of the temple and so uh but they didn't know when abijah was that family group was serving but in the dead sea scrolls it had the list and so we see that abijah was to the eighth division the eighth family group and uh jehoah arab was division one now why is that important uh the temple in jerusalem was destroyed in 70 a.d and uh, we know when it was destroyed. It was the end of July or early August of 70 AD. And Josephus, who wrote uh, the history of the Jews, he was a Jew that was basically co-opted by the Romans, and they wanted him to write a history of this now extinct people group, the Jews, that they had just finished wiping out, and okay, we'll write their history. And Josephus mentions that the Levite family group that was on duty at the temple at the time that the temple was destroyed was Jehoi Arab, the first course. I know it's a little complicated, but it, but it makes sense. So if the end of July or early August is Jehoi Arab, we can count down eight winks and we can see that Abijah was on duty at the temple uh, at the end of September. And here's the scripture from Luke. In the time of Herod, and he died in 4 BC, so we know that this was, um, you know, sort of dates it for us. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. And so uh, Zechariah was in the temple at this end of September. That last week is the week that has the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. And so that's when the angel appeared unto Zechariah, and then he went back, and uh, Elizabeth conceived. And so the Eastern Orthodox Church celebrates 
uh, around September 23rd as the feast of John the Baptist being conceived as the forerunner of Christ. Now, why is that important? Uh, Zacharias, if he's in the temple at the end of September, we know in the scriptures the angel appears to Mary. And she says, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. And the spirit of the Lord came upon Mary and she conceived Jesus. And then it has this line, and your cousin Elizabeth is in her sixth month. And so if we know that Elizabeth conceives the end of September, six months after that is the end of March. And so the date of the end of March is when the uh, the conception of jesus is celebrated it's called the annunciation and uh and then elizabeth visits mary and so nine months after the end of march is the end of december right so did you catch that so there actually is some justification and evidence for december 25th actually being the time that jesus was born and, uh, and this wasn't actually confirmed until 1947. They discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they were able to piece together this order of the different priests. And um, so, picking up with Luke. Is that interesting? Did you like that? <laughs> so, um, so Luke 2, it says, And it came to pass in those days that there came out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Augustus Caesar was the ruler of the most powerful, the biggest empire on the planet, and he wanted to tax everybody. It was... It was his version of a worldwide tracking system. I mean, he wanted to, to count and to have a census and track everybody he controls. So I was wondering how world leaders want to track everybody. Hmm. And they all went to their town to be taxed, and so that's when Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem, and Jesus is born fulfilling Scripture. And this is how big the Roman Empire was. And uh, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth and to Judea where under the city of David which is called Bethlehem to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife which being great with child Luke 2 and suddenly there was the angel um, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace good will toward men now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea in the days of Herod the king behold there came wise men from the east in Jerusalem saying where is the king of the Jews for we have seen his star in the east and come to worship him and then Jesus was born and he knew from the very beginning that he was supposed to be the lamb of God and um, I'll hopefully get into it at the end but the, the, the scenario is that God has existed eternity upon eternity upon eternity upon eternity and he makes everything and he makes everything according to rules Right? So there's law, laws of physics, laws of planetary motion, laws of gravity, laws of optics, everything he makes, and he has laws for human behavior. We just have the choice as to whether or not to follow the laws. Right? But he is a God of laws, and, and when it comes to behavior, that's called being just. So he's just, which means he has to judge every sin. And in law, um, silence equals consent. So if, uh, remember the wedding ceremonies? And the pastor says, anybody that's against this wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're sitting there silent holding your peace, your silence is giving consent to the wedding. And so if there are sins going on and God is silent and not judging the sin, his silence is giving consent to the sin. In common law, all the way back for centuries to England, it's called the rule of tacit admission. Right? So if, there, if you're accused of something and it's really terrible and you don't, you don't deny it or respond to it, then it's assumed that it was true. Right? And so, so if you're at the wedding and you don't say anything, you're giving consent. So if there are sins going on and God is not judging them, his silence is giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to sin, he's no longer a just God. He denies his just nature. He denies himself. And he cannot deny himself. And so he has to judge every sin but he's a loving God and that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. So, he's, so the lamb is God's way to love us without having to judge us. And so Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of Mount Moriah and Abraham's, uh, the son Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice and we have the coals for the sacrifice, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it can be, it has a double meaning. One is, I'm trusting God will have a ram up in a bush so I can sacrifice instead of you, right? 
But the other meaning is God will provide himself as the sacrifice. And that's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten Son of God, became the Lamb to take the judgment for all of our sins. And if you think of it, um, the book of Revelation is God pouring out judgment. And you think, why is that? Well, once and for all, he has to judge every sin that he missed along the way because if he doesn't judge it, he's given consent to it. And if he gives consent to sin, he's no longer just God. And so you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and somebody saying, God, there were these sins back there and you never judged them. No, it says the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. So nobody is ever gonna question that God judges sin. But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. And I, I have a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. And imagine an eternal being, Jesus, who's innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. All right, let me say it again. An eternal being who's innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an infinite period of time, right? Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. He took the wrath of God upon himself, and then he said on the cross, Father, forgive him. And so Jesus became the umbrella. He took the rain, and we're underneath the umbrella, and we're dry. Right? He's like the ark. Uh, he took the, the storm or the flood, but we're safe and warm inside the ark. We're inside it. We're in Christ. And he took the judgment for us. And he knew that was the plan. And so when he came to earth, he knew that his purpose was to be sacrificed, was to take the judgment for all of us. You know, when he's before Pilate, and, it, and the Pilate says, don't, why don't you say anything? Don't you know that I have the power to release you or let you go? And, and I thought, you know, here's Jesus. He's, he's God, I mean, in the flesh. He's brilliant. He could say one sentence and get himself off the hook. But he kept his mouth shut because he knew if he, if he said something and he got off the hook, he would have never been sacrificed to pay for all of our sins. Anyway, so with that, um, Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Does that make sense? Did I? Did I um, now, uh, now I, we're, we're facing persecution. You know, Christianity is the most persecuted religion on the planet. It's been happening in other countries, but it's happening more and more in our country now. But you know what? The church was born into a one-world anti-Christian government, the Roman Empire. I mean, if you or I were going to start a movement, we're like, you know, let's have a little greenhouse. Let it be protected for a little while. Let it get strong before. No, the moment the church was formed, boom, it's facing persecution. Right? And for three centuries, it was persecuted. And the Christian, 10 major persecutions in the first 300 years, Christians were thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. I went to Rome and saw this. I went to school in Rome for six months. Uh, 11 of the 12 apostles were martyred. And there's the different persecutions, Nero, Domitian, Trajan, Septimus, Severus, and all these different ones. And, um, you know, there's Nero, and he, put, he wrapped Christians in burlap and dipped them in tar and put them on poles and, and lit on fire while he watched them burn and it's just cruel stuff um, but then by 260 AD there's an emperor Galenius and he temporarily suspends the persecution and so Christianity is spreading more and more and more and then you have an emperor named Diocletian 285 AD he loses some battles with Persia he asked his generals why and the general said well you've neglected having the army worship the Roman gods and so Diocletian says, okay, army, get back to worshiping the Roman gods. Well, Christians couldn't do that. And so the Christians were purged from the military. Once all the Christians were purged out of the military, Diocletian decided to use the military to force the entire Roman Empire to return to worshiping the Roman gods. And he started the worst persecution in the first three centuries, going province by province, tearing down churches, burning the, the scriptures, you know, boiling them alive, arresting pastors. And it, um, 
He literally wanted to exterminate Christianity. Well, it was during this time that Nicholas was born. And uh, Nicholas was, is the most popular Greek Orthodox saint. Nicholas is to the Greeks what St. Peter is to the Catholics, right? And um, the story is that um, Nicholas lived during this Roman persecution time in the third century in Asia Minor. Today, that's Turkey. And he was in a little town called Patara. And there was a merchant. So there was a movement. Uh, so here you are with Christians meeting in catacombs. Uh, you know, I visited Rome, and so we would, you know, walk down some little road outside of Rome, and there'd be like a little hill with a little drainage ditch looking gate, and the tour guide would like, you know, get a little key and unlock it, and it would be rusty and creak, and you'd have to bend down like this, and you'd just scoot back like here to the wall, and, um, and then it would open up into a little room. And it was carved out of stone. And there was like first century graffiti and candle and torch marks on the ceiling and little passageways that went off, right? This was the Christian experience for three centuries. You would meet in secret in small groups. Every now and then they get raided and thrown to the lions. And so it was during this time um, that a movement started that um, if you're really Christian, you'll give away all your money and... Um, uh, and join a monastery or, or, or um, you know, live in a cave as a hermit, uh, sort of the withdrawing from society. And so here's Nicholas. Um, he, his parents die. This is the Greek Orthodox tradition. His parents die and leave him a lot of money. And he decides he wants to give away his money and go join a monastery in the Holy Land. And so, uh, but he doesn't want to give away the money and get the credit for it. He wants God to get the credit. And so he would sneak into town at nighttime and throw money in the window of poor people. <clears throat> and one story that became popular is a merchant in the town of Patara had gone bankrupt, and the creditors were going to come and not only take his house and lands, they were going to take his children, sex trafficking, all that terrible stuff. And um, Nicholas, the, the father, had an idea. Uh, if he could hurry up and marry his daughters off, the, uh, the creditors couldn't take him. Unfortunately, the father did not have money for a dowry, which was needed in that area of the world for a legally recognized wedding. So Nicholas hears the problem, throws some money in the window at nighttime, and it provides the dowry. The oldest daughter gets married. And then he throws some money in the window for the second daughter, right? And she uh, has a dowry. Now she can get married. Then he throws the money in the window for the third daughter, and then she can get married. And, but by the third time, the, the dad was expecting it, and he runs outside and catches Nicholas, and uh, Nicholas makes the father promise not to tell where the money came from because he wants the glory to go to God, not to him. Uh, here's the stained glass window, and he's throwing the money in the window for the, the girls to have a dowry, and it says, he provides a dowry for three girls. Now, uh, the Greeks uh, liked this, and so they would have a tradition on the anniversary of Nicholas's death, December 6, 343 A.D., that they would uh, leave presents for people anonymously. And... Um, by the way, uh, because of the three bags of gold that Nicholas threw in the window, uh, he's often pictured in artwork with these three gold balls, and, uh, and he became the patron saint of pawnbrokers. <laughs> Seriously, right? And so every pawn shop has three gold balls hanging outside of it to represent the three bags of gold that Nicholas threw in the window to help these daughters get their dowries to get married. Anyway, um, so, uh, so Nicholas gives away all his money and he decides he's going to go to the Holy Land and join a monastery, but somehow the Lord tells him not to hide his light under a bushel, so he goes back to Myra, which is a port city there in uh, Asia Minor, and uh, unbeknownst to him, the bishop had died. And the church leaders could not decide who the next bishop was going to be. And so they uh, are fasting and praying. And one of them gets a dream that the first person to church the next day would be named Nicholas. And he was to be their bishop. And so sure enough, uh, Nicholas shows up at church. And they ask his name. When he says Nicholas, um, they, they take him. Now, Nicholas's habit was to, to not eat the whole day before uh, you'd go to church and have communion. All right, so they would not eat until after church and after communion. That's when they would break the fast. So they called it the break fast or the breakfast. All right. Anyway, so Nicholas shows up at church. They ask his name. They take him into the room, and they all tell him, you're supposed to be our bishop. And he was not too excited about it because the Roman emperor Diocletian was arresting bishops and killing them. 
So it was sort of like, you be the bishop. No, 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 I insist, you first. No, no, really, you be the bishop. <laughs> and so he became the bishop, and sure enough, he was arrested and he was put in jail. And he was awaiting death. And, um, but these Christians, this Diocletian persecution is so bad, the Christians are fasting and praying and seeking God. And after 10 years, Diocletian is struck with an intestinal disease so painful he abdicates the throne on May 1st, 305 A.D. Now, this is a big deal because the emperor by this time had been declaring themselves a god and demanding their image be worshipped and sprinkling gold dust in their hair. Right? And, um, and so this was sort of like a, a god with a little g resigning. I just think it's sort of funny. Anyway, and, um, and so the next emperors, Galerius, he continues the persecution. He's struck with an intestinal disease. He dies in 311 AD. And now it's a toss-up between four generals as to which one is going to be the next emperor. Two are quickly defeated, and now it's down to Constantine and Maxentius. Constantine is in York, England. He is a general. His men say, we're behind you, and they say, hail Caesar, and so he marches toward Rome. And as he's marching toward Rome, uh, Maxentius uh, decides to come out and have a battle at the Milvian Bridge. And so the day before the battle, supposedly Constantine sees the sign of Christ in the sky. And uh, it's the first two Greek letters of the name Christ. And so the Hebrew is Messiah or uh, the anointed one. But in Greek, that name is Christ. And the Greek letter that makes the K sound is an X, but it's called the Chi. And the Greek letter that makes the er sound is called rho, and it's written as a big P. So the first two Greek letters for the name of Christ are X and P, and they call it the chi rho. And so the 312 Battle of the Milvian Bridge, uh, Constantine puts this, shield, this symbol on all of his shields and symbols. He supposedly heard the words um, uh, in hoc signal vinces, which means in this sign you'll be invincible. And so they would abbreviate IHSV. And, um, and so he wins. By the way, here's all the th you know, third and fourth century artwork, but there's the IHSV in hoc signal vinces, and this sign you'll be invincible. And by the way, uh, as the years went on, it got shortened just to the X called the Chi, and it was called the Christ Cross, and that's where you get the Xmas. So Xmas isn't crossing out Christ, it's the Greek letter that stood for Christ, the Chi. And then it became an oath. Where you tell the truth, really going to tell the truth? Yeah, and you'd make the Christ cross, right? Cross my heart, well, why? And then they would, if you're going to swear to keep your word on a document, you would sign at the Christ cross. And that's come down to us to sign at the X. And then they would kiss it to show sincerity, and that's what, on the bottom of the Valentines, that you're swearing before Christ, that you're going to keep your word to this person, and you're kissing it to show sincerity. Do you like that? And uh, <laughs> so... So Constantine officially ends the persecution of Christians in 313 A.D. And now Nicholas is let out of jail. And he goes back to Myra and he preaches against paganism. So uh, an infant exposure and divination. So they still had pagan temples where they did human sacrifice and exposure of unwanted infants. That was the, the Roman version of abortion, right? The mother would bear the child, lay it at the father's feet. If he picked it up, and thought they could afford it, and it looked healthy, they would keep it. But if, if he did not pick it up, the mother would have to put it in a basket and set it outside and let it die. And this is actually how Rome started, right? There was Romulus and Remus that were abandoned children, and a wolf came along and nursed them, right? And so the Romans would do this. And so if there was a couple, they, the, and the wife couldn't keep the kids, she would put it in a basket and lay it at the door of an older couple. And, of course, that's where you get these stories, you know, the knock on the door and the couple opens and there's a baby in the basket, right? Well, that was the Romans. Did. And so the Christians would gather up these babies and raise these orphans, and the Christians would preach against infant exposure. Very, you read the speeches, it's very similar to Christians standing against abortion today, right? And um, anyway, so Nicholas, uh, he's preaching against paganism, and nearby is the temple to Diana. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, it was huge. It had 127 huge pillars and temple prostitutes. It was the Las Vegas of the Mediterranean. The Apostle Paul preached against Diana worship in Acts chapter 19. Remember that? Great is Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. Her image fell from heaven. Well, it was this little pagan idol. And so Nicholas preaches against Diana worship so much 
I mean, he's a fire and brimstone preacher. They tear the temple to Diana down. And, uh, and then there's the Arian heresy. So for the first three centuries of Christianity, Christians really don't live long enough to argue over doctrine. <laughs> they just, Jesus touched my life. And it's like, okay, he'll kill you, you know. And, um, but now uh, there was a bishop named Arius, and he starts the first heresy. He says Jesus was a little less than God. He was a created being, and it begins to split the church. And the Visigoths, who were a tribe that came into Rome, they convert to Arianism, and it, um, it splits the church so much that it's having fallout politically for Constantine. It's like, look, Christians, I legalize you. Now you're fighting, and, and it's splitting my kingdom. So Constantine not only orders, he pays for all the bishops around the world to come to one place and settle it, Nicaea, so they write the Nicaean Creed. And uh, again, the first time ever that all the bishops came to one place. And the story is that um, they obviously condemned Arius, and so there's Arius in the little pit down there. And, um, uh, and there. And so the story is that uh, Nicholas was so upset at Arius for starting the Arian heresy that he slapped him across the face. So jolly old St. Nick had a little temper. <laughs> you better watch out if he's coming to town. <laughs> I, was looking for, I was looking for some of these pictures on the internet, and I found this one. It says, uh, I came to give presents to kids and to punch heretics. I just ran out of presents. <laughs> <laughs> And so the Greeks have lots and lots of stories about him. I put it in my book, but some of the more notable ones is there's a famine and um, uh, the people didn't have food. And so Nicholas goes down and talks the sailors into their grain from North Africa. He talks them into unloading grain to feed his people and promises that God will bless them. And so they unload the grain and then they get to Rome. And then when they're on the return trip, they said, yeah, the grain that was left had multiplied and we had more than enough. Sort of like Elijah and the little widows and the meal barrel. That, right? And then there's the story of a storm. And the storm was so bad the sailors couldn't get back. And Nicholas goes down and prays and the sea becomes calm. And the sailors could come back. And so he's also considered the patron saint of sailors. And uh, he's often pictured with that. So I, right, there's the boat and there's Nicholas, right? And it's calm in the sea. And, and then there's a corrupt pol politician, a governor. And he was doing corrupt things and was was going to execute some soldiers who knew about it to cover up his evil, wicked deeds, sort of a body count list, you know? And, um, and so Nicholas has a dream of all the corrupt stuff the governor did. He goes down to the execution spot, grabs the sword out of the executioner's hand, throws it down, and then in front of everybody tells all the details of what this corrupt governor was doing. And the governor realized that nobody could do all the details other than God. And so he begs Nicholas to pray for him that God would have mercy on his soul. All right? So thank God for pastors that have guts to stand up to corrupt governors. And, um, <laughs> so Nicholas dies December 6, 343 A.D., and he is so popular. Again, he is like a founding father to the Greek Orthodox Church. So Justinian, who's a Christian Roman emperor, he um, has a, uh, builds a church and names it after Nicholas. Now, uh, there's, then there's an, another emperor named Theodosius, and he outlaws paganism. And he outlaws human sacrifice, divination, destroys pagan temples, removes temple prostitutes, and he ends the Olympics. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you knew, but uh, I went to, again, I went to school in Europe for six months, and we went to Athens, we went to Olympus. Uh, they, they, they ran the Olympics naked. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the word gym for gymnasium, gym is the Greek word for naked. And, and so the, they would have these, um, a lot of the Greeks were into all those states of statues with no clothes on and everything, and, and they glorified the human body and, and so forth. So Theodosius was a Christian Roman emperor, so he outlaws the Olympics and... Um, but anyway, at this time, you have a bunch of nominal people that were used to be pagans, and they flood into the church saying, well, since paganism is outlawed, I guess I'm a Christian, and whatever the, the state doctrine is, I'm for it. And so you have a lot of, a lot of people come in that um, didn't really have a heart change. But during this time, you have a, a church built uh, that's named after Nicholas, and it's in Demray, Turkey today. And so... Uh, so they, uh, but, but in Islam, that you're forbidden to repair a church when it's, when it's collapsing. And so these churches would just end up uh, collapsing. And, um, but it's named after Nicholas. Uh, then a couple other things. So the Eastern Orthodox Church, they celebrated the three wise men visiting. 
as the most important day of the season because that's when Jesus is revealed to the world and uh, it's called Epiphany. But the Catholic West celebrated December 25th the birth of Jesus as the holiest day and they could not decide which day was holier so at the Council of Tours in 567 AD they decided to make all 12 days between December 25th and January 6th the 12 days of Christmas and they call them holy days which we pronounce today holiday and so the, it's not the 12 days leading up to Christmas it's the 12 days between December 25th and January 6th and, uh, and then Russia had a emperor named Vladimir the Great and he was pagan, but he decided he was going to embrace monotheism. So he throws all the Russian pagan tribal gods into the Dnieper River, and then he uh, lets the word out that he's going to embrace monotheism. And so the Jews called Khazars, they come and they tell him about their faith, and he's like, yeah, but you were kicked out of your city, and, and uh, why should I? And, and then some Catholics come, and then the Muslims come. And the first chronicle of Russia, of Vladimir's court, it says when the Muslim ambassadors told Vladimir that, that paradise was filled full of virgins, he, he liked it because he was very fond of women. And, uh, but then it says where they, they could no longer drink alcohol. Uh, Vladimir said, we cannot have this because drink is the joy of the Russes, the Russians. I think it's funny that Russia did not convert to Islam because Vladimir liked to drink. Um, <laughs> but then the Greek Orthodox came. And these Greek Orthodox said, look, we speak Greek, the language of the New Testament. Our land was where John spoke and Paul spoke. And some of the um, ambassadors from Russia had gone to Constantinople and into the Hagia Sophia. And it's 165 feet high, 102 foot, foot across dome. And the ambassador said, it was like walking into heaven. And, and so Vladimir converts to Eastern Orthodox Christianity and he adopts Nicholas as the patron saint of Russia. So that's why you have so many Russian czars named Nicholas and Nikolai and so forth. And um, uh, so then we have Islam invades and they conquer into Turkey. And so they conquered Egypt, which used to be Christian, evangelized by Mark. And then they conquered North Africa, which used to be Christian. There used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa. St. Augustine of Hippo was from Carthage. Today, that's Tunisia. Then they invaded Spain in, in 711 AD. And in 10 years, they conquered all of Spain. And then the Turks convert to Islam, and they conquer into what is today Turkey. All seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were wiped out by the Muslim Turks. And as they're conquering, they would destroy churches and... and uh, then they would destroy graves. And so this is when the Christians move the remains of St. Nicholas from Myra over to a little town in Italy called Bari, B-A-R-I. And, and so the uh, Pope dedicates uh, the church. And it's called um, Cathedral Nicolo de Bari, Cathedral of Nicholas of Bari, to, and that's where they put the remains of St. Nicholas. But this introduces this Greek saint and all the gift giving that went along on the anniversary of his death to Western Europe. And the Western Europeans really liked that. And um, by the way, the Pope that dedicates this Cathedral Nicolo de Bari is Urban II. And you may not be up on all your Pope names, but that's the same Urban II that had so many Greeks fleeing that he went to the Consul um, of Claremont and um, <clears throat> begged the European kings to send help. And they do, it's called the First Crusade. Right? So the same Pope that welcomed the Nicholas's uh, remains to Western Europe is the one that called for the First Crusade to rescue these Greeks who were being killed. And so there's, um, now the, the Islam had 14 centuries of crusades and it's still going on. But these Europeans had these two centuries of crusades. And, um, but um, the, the remains of Nicholas were taken from there over to, to Bari, Italy. This was interesting. This is 2009. Uh, the Turkish newspaper says, Turkish cultural and tourism minister Ert Gürl Gune told reporters in Anatolia Sunday that there were plans to demand the return of the bones of St. Nicholas. So they're like, we want them back. But, um, but now that these gift-giving traditions on December 6th are in Western Europe, and it's so popular that St. Francis of Assisi starts the, creates the nativity scene sort of in protest, saying all the gift giving is fine, but we need to get back to the reason for the season. Jesus, the Son of God, was born in a manger. And so whenever you see a crash scene, that goes back to St. Francis of Assisi in 1223. And um, then the Reformation starts in 1517. And by this time, there's a saint's day for every day of the year. Matter of fact, there's lots of saint's days every day of the year. 
and the cathedrals are filled full of relics and statues and all kinds of uh, things that Martin Luther considered a distraction from Christ. And so he ends all the saints' days, including the popular St. Nicholas Day, and he moves all the gift-giving to December 25th and says, all gifts come from the Christ child. And the German pronunciation of Christ child is Chris Kindle. You know, like kindergarten, kinder care, kind means child, and, and Chris means Christ. And over the centuries, Chris Kindle got pronounced Chris Kringle. So Chris Kringle is really Chris Kindle, which means Christ child. And um, now Martin Luther, uh, he, uh, this is a woodcut, right? They would carve in wood and then stamp it in ink and then put it on pages. And so uh, here's a picture of Martin Luther with his wife and his kids. And what, what's that one kid got on the left? It's, it's a crossbow. You could put your eye out with one of those things. <laughs> It's their version of a BB gun, right? <laughs> Little boys like something they can shoot. I just think that's sort of funny. And um, anyway, and so Martin Luther is responsible for putting the candles in the tree. And uh, why is that? Well, two parts, the candles and then the tree. The, the tree. Um, remember, St. Patrick was from Britain, and he goes to Ireland, and he converts the pagan Druids. And... Uh, St. Boniface is from Britain, and he goes to Germany, and he converts the Germanic tribes. And so St. Boniface, he's also called Winfred, in 722 AD, this is the same time that Islam is conquering through Spain into southern France, uh, St. Boniface uh, goes to Geismar and um, Germany, and they worship Thor, and Thor, and they worship Woden. Woden is where we get the word Wednesday, and Thor is where we get the word Thursday or Thursday. These are Germanic words. And the Germanic tribes, they had an oak tree that Thor lived in, and they would do sacrifice in front of it, and even maybe human sacrifice. And, and so uh, St. Boniface shows up, and he takes out his axe, and he chops down Thor's tree. And... Um, some people say, well, stop. And, these, and then somebody else said, well, if Thor's really a god, he can certainly protect his own tree. And he didn't. And so uh, they chopped down the tree, and now St. Boniface is evangelizing all of these Germanic pagans that he just chopped down their, their god's tree. And um, uh, then he points to an evergreen tree. So remember, um, uh, so here's Henry Van Dyke. He writes the first Christmas tree in 1906. St. Boniface, Winfred, apostle to the Germans, the day before Christmas in the year of our Lord, 722. Not a drop of blood. This is what St. Boniface told these, these pagan Germans. Not a drop of blood shall fall tonight, for this is the birth night of Christ, Son of God, uh, Savior of the world. And then he points to an evergreen. This little tree, the young child of the forest, shall be your home tree tonight. Its wood is a wood of peace, for your houses are built of fir. It is the sign of everlasting life, for its branches are evergreen. It points toward heaven. Let this be called the tree of the Christ shall gather about it with loving gifts of kindness. So instead of the oak tree that's pagan, now it's this evergreen tree, and it's, it's evergreen. It points toward heaven. And the evidence points to St. Boniface used the evergreen tree to teach the Trinity because it's always in like in the shape of a triangle, very similar to St. Patrick using the three-leaf clover to teach the Trinity. I mean, here's illiterate, you know, tribal people that can't even read, and you're trying to convey to them a spiritual concept right and so you so that's the idea now lights on the tree um so uh did, did you under, did you get that that's sort, i think it's sort of interesting because i've run into people that say well i gotta take the tree down it's all pagan it's all pagan it's like no dig a little deeper right and um so uh there's actually a statue in um let's see here so here's a statue of nicholas in a, one of those german towns on the stump of a great big oak tree and with an axe in his hand and then he's holding a church to say that he brought the church to these Germans. And um, so it's, it's, it wasn't, the oak tree was bad, but the evergreen tree was good. And um, there's even a scripture, and I think Ezekiel, where it says, you were like a tree evergreen. Um, and the light, lights on the tree. Well, now the Jews from the 2nd century B.C. Uh, had the Hanukkah, and they would put lights up. And so uh, the Maccabees, uh, we're, we're driving out these Syrian pagans from Jerusalem in 165 B.C., and the temple had been trashed, and the menorah candles had been put out, and they had special oil that the Bible says you have to prepare it in a special way, 
and uh, it takes a week to prepare. And so they only had a little bit, and they poured it in, but that little bit kept this candle burning all week long. Gave them time to make. And so there were these eight days, and so that's the eight candles in the menorah. And so the thought is that Martin Luther may have seen some of the candles that the Jews had in the wintertime and then had the idea of putting the candles in the, the tree and telling his children, this is like the sky above Bethlehem on the night of Christ's birth, right? All the stars in the sky and so forth. And um, how am I doing? Is this okay? And um, so Henry VIII brings the Reformation to England not because he had a spiritual experience like Martin Luther. He just wanted another wife. And then he ended up having six wives. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. Henry VIII was not a really nice guy to be married to. But during Henry VIII's time, he brings back an old Roman holiday, right? The, the parts of Saturnalia. Rome uh, controlled Britain all the way from 45 B.C. with Julius Caesar invading Rome. And so the Romans had, around um, December 22nd, it was their Saturnalia, and it was a, a time of feasting and partying, and, their, and Saturn was their, their, their god of all this type of stuff. And so if you've ever seen the Christmas Carol with Charles Dickens, there's the spirit of Christmas present, and you're looking at this guy saying, who is he? He sort of looks like Santa, but he also sort of looks like some Roman god. Well, that was Saturn, but they Christianized him and called him Father Christmas. They couldn't call him St. Nicholas because saints were outlawed, right? The Reformation came, and they got rid of all the saint stuff. And um, anyway, so during Henry VIII's time, uh, Christmas in England became sort of a Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is actually the day before Lent when you would fast 40 days before Easter. And now Mardi Gras is this lewd party in New Orleans Right? So it went from a spiritual thing to a... That's sort of what happened with Henry VIII. They would do drinking and wassailing. They'd take a drink of booze and throw it on some plant for a nice harvest next year. They would carouse. They would, like, you know, have parties, and the guys would be chasing the girls. And, um, and the Puritans come along. And the Puritans uh, think that all of that stuff is too worldly. And they would say things, can, you know, can God be honored by mad mirth and hard drinking and a party fit for a Bacchus or a Mohammedan Ramadan? Certainly the, or the Son of God cannot be glorified by all this, you know, liquoring up and stuff. And so the Puritans got rid of all these Christmas festivities. They were really strict. Matter of fact, the Puritans were so strict, they forbade Shakespeare from mentioning God in his plays. And so that's when Shakespeare wrote his, uh, they considered casting pearls before swine or taking God's name in vain to mention the name of God in front of a bunch of people at a theater. And, and um, so that's when Shakespeare began to write his Midsummer Night's Dream and all these little fairies because he wanted something supernatural in his play and he couldn't mention God. And so he, uh, but the, the Puritans were so strict. Matter of fact, the Twelfth Night, which was Shakespeare's play, it's the, right, the Twelfth Night of what? The Twelfth Night of Christmas. Um, in there... The, the 12th night has a carnivalesque drunken revelry based on the ancient Roman festival of Saturnalia, right? And so we can see that, um, anyway, so the Puritans considered theaters dens of iniquity and they forced the Globe Theater to close down in 1642 and they pulled it down in 1644. The Puritans pulled down William Shakespeare's Globe Theater. And um, anyway, so it was during this time that the pilgrims came to America, and the pilgrims um, did not celebrate Christmas. They thought Sabbath was the holy day and every other day should be the same. And so the captain of the Mayflower, Christopher Jones, writes in the ship's log December 25th, 1620, at Harbor in Plymouth Harbor, Christmas Day, but not observed by these colonists, they being opposed to all saints' days, etc. A large party went ashore this morning to fell timber, began to build their, their building, and they began to erect the first house about 20 feet square. Their common use received them and their goods. Bradford, uh, the next year, William Bradford, the governor of the Pilgrims, writes this. One more incident rather amusing. On Christmas Day, the governor called the people out to work as usual, but most of the new company, it was a second boatload of Pilgrims, excused themselves and said it went, went against their conscience to work on that day. So the governor told them, if they made it a matter of conscience, he would spare them till they became better informed. So he, so he went with the rest and left them, but on returning from work at noon, he found them at play in the street, some pitching the bar and some stool ball and such like sports. 
So the governor went to them and took away their games and told them that it was against his conscience that they should play and others work. If they made the keeping of the day a matter of devotion, let them remain in their houses, but there should be no gaming and revelering in the streets. All right, so the, the pilgrims and the Puritans were really strict. The Puritans actually had a five-shilling fine for anybody caught celebrating Christmas, right? But, um, but then the Dutch settled New Amsterdam, which became New York, and the Dutch loved Christmas. And so most of our traditions come down. Uh, the Dutch pronunciation of St. Nicholas is Saint Nicholas. Saint, Saint, not Nicholas, Claus, Santa Claus. Now, um, it's an interesting little line here. So you know the Catholic saying that St. Peter's at the gates of heaven? Well, the Greeks and the Dutch do a take on Jesus returning at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead riding a white horse. And the saints will come back with him riding white horses. And St. Nicholas is one of the saints, so he will be one of those riding a white horse. He just gets to come back once a year for a little mini judgment, a little checkup on the kids, see who's naughty, see who's nice. So the Dutch to this day have St. Nicholas coming dressed as a bishop riding a white horse. And, um, uh, and then heaven turns into the, uh, you know, the, the New Jerusalem, the celestial city turns into the North Pole. And the angels keep the Lamb's Book of Life and the Book of Works. This turns into the elves keeping the Book of the Naughty and the Nice. And uh, so here's some Dutch kids looking at, you know, there's Nicholas with the book. And uh, look at that little kid. He didn't look too happy. It doesn't look like you've been a good boy this year. I'm going to (laughs) cry. And so the Dutch have the tradition that uh, St. Nicholas will give the good kids presents, uh, but the naughty kids, um, they'll get sold into slavery. And... um, now, in Norway, they didn't have horses, so they have reindeer. And um, by the way, uh, the Dutch... Now, now uh, mo- the Dutch have St. Nicholas having a little Muslim helper named Zwarte Piet. And he's the one who takes the kids and sells them into slavery. So, um, so Muhammad was a white Arab. There are hadiths that says some people came to visit him, and they said he is the white man reclining on the couch. There's another hadith that he went to, to pray and lift his arms, and they said they saw the whiteness of his armpits. Another hadith says that the guy is on his donkey, rubs up against Muhammad, said, I saw the whiteness of the prophet's thigh, and Muhammad owned black slaves. And within the 1,400 years of Islam, uh, it's responsible for enslaving over 180 million Africans. And in Arabic, they have one word for African and slave. It's abid, right? So every black person they would call slave. Right? And so Muhammad, and then the, and the, and so, uh, but then the Muslims also enslaved about a million Europeans. And so there were whole Catholic orders in Europe through the Middle Ages called the Trinitarians. And the head of the order was called the Ransomer. And they would collect alms and donations and, so, uh, and f- buy back your friends. So this was a big scare. And so they would tell the little Dutch kids, if you're good, St. Nicholas will give you a present. If you're not good, his helper, Zwarte Piet, will put you in a gunny sack, take you back to Spain, and sell you into Muslim slavery. And um, I, I have uh, 11 brothers and sisters. I have uh, five brothers. Uh, I would have loved to have told this to my little brothers. Hey, <laughs> Santa Claus is coming. Might not see you. You haven't been too good, you know. <laughs> actually, actually, he was doing a radio interview, and a guy calls in, and he goes, yeah, I was raised in Holland, and the night before Sinterklaas visited, um, all the little boys would make sure to go to sleep at night with pocket knives in their pockets. <laughs> I said, why is that? He goes, that's to cut us out of the gunny sack if we woke up and we're being taken away. And, uh, and then, of course, some of the traditions, the, uh, the Svarte Pete's looking really bad, you know? Here he is shoving that kid in the basket. And um, anyway, so the Dutch settled New York. And they have a, the biggest merchant military fleet in the world. I mean, they've got Jakarta, India. they got South Africa. They have Goa. They have Indonesia. And, um, and so St. Nicholas is the patron saint of sailors. The Dutch would have on the front of their boat, not a Poseidon or a mermaid, but a figurehead of St. Nicholas. And so they come and settle New Amsterdam. And the first church they name in New York City is, you guessed it, St. Nicholas founded in 1642, right? Battery City along Wall Street there. And it went on to become the biggest Protestant church in America. And so they actually built this enormous cathedral there at the corner of 48th and 5th Avenue. And uh, 
But as the city turned into a financial district, a whole lot of people moved out. And so they had this cavernous church with maybe a dozen people that went there. And so Sinclair Oil Company came and said, we would like to buy that. And they bought it and tore it down. And that's sad. And um, anyway, but then they went and started the, the, the Dutch took the money and started the um, collegiate, Marble Collegiate Church. And that's where Norman Vincent Peale went and lots of other people, including Donald Trump, went there. And, uh, but the biggest church in Holland is the St. Nicholas Church. And so these Dutch traditions of St. Nicholas coming um, uh, spread. And in New York, you had a writer named Washington Irving. He wrote Rip Van Winkle, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And he also wrote Dietrich Knickerbocker's History of New York from the beginning of the New World to the end of the Dutch Dynasty. And he says, St. Nicholas rides over the housetops, drawing forth magnificent presents, dropping them down the chimneys of his favorites. Now he visits us one night a year. He rattles down the chimney, confining his presents to children. Stockings found mysteriously filled. Washington Irving describes him. Uh, now, Washington Irving is the one who gave us the word Gotham to describe New York, right? Gotham City. And, but um, he describes Nicholas not... As a still a saint, he's still a bishop, but he's not dressed as a bishop. He's dressed in a typical Dutch outfit of stocking hat, long trunk hose, uh, and large pipe, and so forth, and laying his fingers out his nose, significant look, and he mounts the wagon and disappears. And so these Dutch would leave uh, presents for each other. And uh, then in 1823, in New York, an Anglican Hebrew professor named Clement Moore writes a poem for his children. And uh, there is, in New York, at 10th Avenue and 22nd Street, Clement Moore Park. And so Clement Moore's story was called what? A Visit from St. Nicholas. And you know it, right? It was a night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouth. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that who? St. Nicholas would soon be there. And another, you know, uh, with a little driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. And anyway, I go through all the whole poem. I wrote a book on this, um, but uh, so we see a little change to his um, additions to the St. Nicholas story. And then Thomas Nast is the illustrator for Harper's Weekly Magazine, and he is the one who gave us the Republican elephant and Democrat mule. And he did a uh, illustration during the Civil War with St. Nicholas associated with the North, and he put a North Pole sign behind it. And that was a, actually a political jab at the South to say St. Nicholas belongs to the North. And, um, and then you had the 1800s and a lot of nor more changing, but then the early 1900s, Haddon Sunblom, an artist, he's the one that gave his Quaker Oats and Aunt Jemima. He is hired by Coca-Cola, and he does a painting every year of Santa Claus drinking Coke. And um, Coca-Cola invented mass marketing, and so this is the image that was spread around the world. And But they're really, uh, uh, you know, it's the... <laughs> I sort of skipped over it for the sake of time. But, uh, <laughs> but the poem says, The right jolly pump old elf, I laugh when I saw him and spied myself. And it says, The stump of a pipe yell tightened his teeth and smoked it encircled his head like a wreath. It's like, when did he take up tobacco? It's like, <laughs> tobacco came from the American Indians, right? And so, um, so anyway, they, they decided that they were going to have him uh, <laughs> selling Lucky Strikes and Camel and everything. Um, anyway, so... Um, but the, the, the story is that there really was a man named Nicholas who loved Jesus so much that he wanted to give away all his money and then join a monastery and give his life to the Lord. But then he decided he wanted to go into the ministry and he became a bishop. He was willing to go to prison for his faith in Jesus. And then he comes out and he preaches against paganism and sexual immorality and he's a fire and brimstone preacher. And then he stands up for the doctrine of the Trinity, slapping areas, but he stands up for, for biblical truth. And then he, he confronts corrupt politicians, right, calling them out. But we remember him most because he was generous and he gave. And so here we are today and we are remembering uh, the, the story of St. Nicholas and then the story of Christmas. Now, there's a whole lot more because uh, Christmas goes on to be the um, most important day in Western civilization. There's all kinds of battles and so forth. Uh, there was one, the Battle of the Bulge, with um, uh, all the troops were behind enemy lines in Baston. Uh, the General Anthony McAuliffe is surrounded. The Nazis tell him, you're surrounded. He says, nuts. And it sort of confuses the Nazi commanders to what he meant. Anyway, Patton comes to his rescue, but it's snowing, and his men can't uh, go. And so he orders his chaplain to compose a prayer, and they print it on a quarter of a million index cards, pass it out to his troops. 
And on one side is the, the prayer, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness. We're saying these in moderate rains. Anyway, the flip side is his Christmas greeting to his troops. And uh, it says, uh, to each officer and soldier in the third United States Army, I wish a Merry Christmas, right? George Patton. And, um, but after the men pray, the sky clears, the, sa- the planes can fly, his men, his men can, and they come to the rescue of the 101st Airborne, and the Nazis were trying to get to Antwerp, Holland, to get gas. Now they can't. They run out of gas, and a couple months later, the war's over. And, uh, but again, Christmas. And you got our president, FDR, saying... Um, it's not easy to say Merry Christmas to you, my fellow Americans, in this time of destructive war. We will celebrate this Christmas Day in our traditional American way because the teachings of Christ are fundamental in our lives. The story of the coming of the immortal Prince of Peace. And then Truman, 1946, lights the national Christmas tree, and he says, Our hopes of future years turn to a little town in the hills of Judea where on a winter's night 2,000 years ago, the prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled. Shepherds keeping their watch by night over their flock heard the glad tidings of great joy from the angels of the Lord singing glory to God in the highest peace, goodwill toward men. The message of Bethlehem best sums up our hopes tonight. If we as a nation and other nations of the world will accept that the star of faith will guide us into the place of peace as it did the shepherds on the day of Christ's birth long ago. And then the last mention is Apollo 8 is circling the moon. In 1968, first uh, uh, space mission to do that. And um, they have a broadcast from the space capsule on Christmas Eve, 1968, and they read the first chapter of the book of Genesis. So the entire planet is listening, and then they give their Christmas greeting. And they end it by saying, and from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, and a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. And Nixon says, Apollo astronauts flew over the moon's gray surface on Christmas Eve. They spoke to us the the beauty of Earth, and in that voice so clear across the lunar distance, we heard them invoke God's blessings on its goodness. All right, and so so there's the, the stamp. But the last is our calendar. Our calendar goes back to the birth of Jesus. Right? Right now it's it's you know 2021. 2021 what? 2021 years back to the birth of Christ. Uh, Anno Domini in the year of our Lord's reign. Now, give or take a couple years because uh, it was in the 5th century that a, a monk named uh, Dionysus Exegus, you know, tried to do the math. And, and um, so it may have been 4 BC, but here's a great quote from Clarence Mannion, the dean of the Notre Dame Law School. And he was appointed by, FD, by Eisenhower. Um, and he said this, the long march of measured time suddenly stopped and did an about face and started to march in another direction and to a different drum straight through the ensuing centuries of Christ and Christendom. B.C., before Christ, and A.D., Anno Domini, the year of, the, of our Lord, mark each one of the only reliable milestones along the path of world history. The end of the first time chain and the beginning of the second came together on the night that Christ was born in Bethlehem. The first Christmas day thus stands as the great divide for the timing and recording of all people, things, and events that have lived or taken place upon this earth. The one time on the long, long trail of time where the magnetic needle of history stands vertical and points up. So we remember Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of the universe, the only begotten Son of the Father, and he came, became a lamb, took the judgment of the just Almighty Father so that you and I can approach our Heavenly Father, this all-perfect, all-powerful, universe-creating being who's all completely just, and you can approach him without fear of judgment. Because Jesus took the judgment in your place. Anyway, thank you so much. God bless.